Good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as I said earlier, my name is Melissa D'Agostino, and it's my great pleasure to now help facilitate um, a Q&A with the director of, um, and the actor. Um, so um, if you put your hands up, we'll try and get to as many questions as possible. I'll also try to um, reiterate the question on the microphone so we all know what's being asked. Um, yeah, and I'm looking very forward to uh, this Q&A, as I'm sure you are. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome back to the stage here, the director of What Richard Did, Lenny Abrahamson. Thanks very much, and thanks for staying. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> I should know. Um, so first of all, I want to just introduce the amazing um, lead actor, Jack Rainer. Hi, um, it's a good question. I mean, I suppose there were two reasons for, for choosing Lars. One was because, I, and I don't think this applies to European films so much, and probably not to North American film, but certainly in, in um, Britain and Ireland, there's a tendency when dealing with the middle classes on film, and, and they aren't often dealt with on film from where I come from, um, there's a tendency to sort of go for a cookie cutter picture of, of the family, you know, and, and is a father who looks over his newspaper and a, you know, a kind of coffee making machine in the kitchen and it, it's, a, it's a version, a very sort of easily digested version of the middle class. So what I wanted to do was just to give the family some particularities, you know, and I, I grew up in a, you know, I, I came from that, I come from that background also. And when you scratch the surface you find all sorts of details and um, unusual uh, specifics about a family and it just it seemed that that was one way to get away from that cliche and then the other reason is I just really like Lars as an actor and felt <laughs> so the, the rest is post rationalization the, the real answer is that I really like Lars and, and, and feel that there's something he has this capacity to, to portray a, uh, a sort of man who's there's a tremendous sensitivity in him without but very believable very kind of Grounded, and, and you know, I'm really pleased that I made that decision and that he was prepared to do it. Great. Thank you for your question. Um, yes, in the back row. Um, I read something online when I was looking into this movie that I believe it's Jack, who's just signed uh, to, is it a North American agency? Are you going to be making movies in Hollywood now? Um, <laughs> the question is for Jack, and uh, if you are moving over to Hollywood to make some films. <coughs> That's right, I just signed up with, with uh, WME. Uh, I've got a great agent there, really nice guy. And I'm an American citizen myself, so I don't need a visa. Uh, <laughs> which is pretty handy. So I'm actually out to LA in the morning. And I've got a couple of exciting projects that are, that are coming up. Um, so we'll see what happens over the next couple of months. Great. We'll keep looking up for you. Um, uh, more questions in the house? Can I ask about the um, scenes with the groups of teenagers? How much of that was scripted and much was improvised? Because it seems very real. Yes, great. So the question is surrounding the, the scenes with the groups of teenagers. How much was scripted and how much, if any, was improvised? Um, it was the process that we went through. We, we, I worked with the, the group, I cast the group first, and not all of the people that I cast had parts uh, in the script that we had at that point. So I just sort of knew that they would be in the film somehow, and we. we, we wrote them in. But I suppose to answer the question, there are two or three key points in the film where there's some improvisation. Like the group scene in the beach house when Jack is talking about being in a bathroom with girls who are bulimic can. Um, there's, then there's a, a scene, particularly at the end, in, uh, around the campfire and uh, where they're talking, just telling sort of stories where Jack is trying to re-inhabit the guy that he used to be. Um, and and, and uh, What we did, it's not sort of it's a very controlled improvisation. We knew how those conversations would run. 
we, we had worked on them a lot, we talked a lot with, I talked a lot with the actors about those, particularly the night, the, the night scenes, so they call it the DMC, a deep meaningful conversation, and, which we all remember from when we were teenagers, where you, you, know, you think you've talked, you've, you've had the most profound conversation. Um, so the guys were very skilled at being able to go into that and sort of they found that find the rhythms and the paces and they knew what, they, they had sort of a repertoire of stories and ideas that they could cover. And in the scene around the fire when, when, when Jack visits the group behind the cricket nets, well, it was quite interesting because some of the kids were extras and they really were sort of in awe of Patty and Jack, the two like quote proper actors in the film. And that played in, that it allowed Jack to sort of wax kind of, you know, he allowed them to, to, to occupy that position and they were keen to be smart in their responses and therefore it had the right kind of dynamic. But I'd say, you know, 80 to 90% of the film is, is scripted. The durable story is true as well. I really did dream of a Yes, right here. Okay, so two questions. The first is Jack's age in the film, and um, a question about distribution. Um, well, Jack was supposed to be 19, and he was 19 when we shot it, um, which was last year. Um, and uh, yes, it, it has actually. Uh, uh, the, there's been quite a you know good response to the film here, and it's been picked up for a few charities. And I think uh, we have to wait till they can announce that officially. But it looks like it will be shown in in a number of places theatrically, which is which is great for me. I'm Thank you. Um, yes, right here. I guess I'm curious about the ending of the film. Because um, the writer obviously left it. To me, that's so hard for me to be brought on a journey and not know what happens in the end. So I'm wondering as a director and for the actors, did you guys decide what was going to happen in the end to help you along the, uh, the process, I guess? Great, so the question is, um, how you dealt with the ending in terms of shooting and acting, um, given what the script gave you? Well, we, we developed the script together, so that was always, we discussed that all the way through. For me, the ending is, it, it's oblique, certainly, but it, at least for me, it feels kind of emotionally complete in that you feel that you're with this, um, okay, I don't think it's possible to know really ever how a person feels, and certainly in those extreme situations. And therefore, it's in the nature of that kind of filmmaking that, that what you want to do is render the exterior truthfully and allow people to sort of project internally. And there is, I mean, it's a very subtle thing, but there's a little Jack, he's sitting at the table, he is working, he looks up, he takes a drink of water, and there's a little movement of his eyes. And, you know, it's not clear at that point if he's going to get up and walk, and or if he's going to go through the same experience he went through in the beach house, or if he's going to just simply turn back to his book I suppose the film poses the question, is it possible that he just continues on with his life um, successfully, which is, which is disturbing, but for me at least it's, it's a realistic possibility. Maybe Jack, you'd like to talk about how you felt at that point and, and what you, how you sort of imagine his life as, uh, as, as the story continues. Well, I mean, I think everybody, all of us who were involved all had a different idea for the ending of the film and everybody's ending is valid, but for me I think that the character is gonna bear the weight of of this whole event for the rest of his life, and it's gonna be something that he definitely carries and feels. But I, I don't think he's ever gonna have himself in, um, and I don't think he'll ever talk to anybody about it. And there'll always be that pain between himself and his father, and things will never be able to go back to the way they were for him. But again, that idea that he might be able to successfully continue his life—that's a very distinct possibility for me as well. Thank you. And thank you for your question. Any more questions out there? Yes, sir. Uh, um, congratulations on a great movie, and Jack, I'm glad you got over your good uh, times last night. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for doing that. The movie's based on a, on a book called A Bad Day in Black Rock, which has obviously got something to do with the, the school rugby culture in Dublin. Can you tell us a bit more about that book and how it influenced the uh, making of the Great, so the question is about the source material, the book that the film is based on, and just a little bit about that. So the history of the project, which we acknowledge in the in the in the 
credits, it's based, it says based on a book by Dave Blackrock by Kevin Power. So I read the book after it had been optioned by the film company that I worked very closely with. And um, I was sort of in two minds. I was very interested in the character of Richard, and that's in the end what happened. I sort of took that character and worked with the writer, and we then developed it freely without feeling we would need to be constrained by the story of the book. Um, I suppose for a couple of reasons. Firstly, that just felt to me the most interesting journey through the story, and I was intrigued to think about this boy and I felt sort of for this boy. We, we also changed lots of aspects of this character, just as, they seemed to, as it seemed to make sense to us. But also the book has echoes of a particular event. You know, it's, it's for those who, people, Irish people will know, there's a particular uh, killing outside a nightclub. Um, and I didn't want my film to have the burden of being based on a true story, and I wanted it to be a fictional film. So very consciously, I broke some ties with the book. In terms of rugby culture, it's not a film about bullying. I mean, you know, we're always, there's a big, always a big debate about bullying in schools, and, and it's a valid thing to talk about. But I think a film that shows a bully is not that interesting. It, it says bully bullies. Um, what I think is more interesting to me is is a, is a culture of uh, of uh, a, a, pre a culture which puts pre puts pressure on on young people, particularly young guys, to to be a certain way, to fulfill a kind of ideal of, of, of decency and of, of fair play. And those schools tend to push that very hard. And I think Jack's tragedy, or uh, sorry, um, uh, Richard's tragedy is to take that seriously in that he, he, he holds himself to a very high standard. He's not able to fail. He's not a, he doesn't understand how to, to disappoint himself. And so when he does, even in small ways, disappoint himself, that has a kind of catastrophic effect on him, and maybe, maybe if anything, it addresses that culture of of self belief, uh, you know, which is, seems to me to these days to be something which we're supposed to believe is unquestionably, unquestionably positive, and I don't think it really is. I think a certain self doubt and acquaintance with failure is a very important part of a, a person's development. I mean, Jack, do you want to say anything about that? About those schools, I and mean, Jack, you went to a school like that. So. Yeah, I said before, like having gone to one of those schools, um, but not really have, haven't been uh, in that loop of the sports and having never really put that much pressure on myself academically either. Um, <laughs> I, I had observed it though, and I, I, I kind of understood the mentality behind it, and I saw the family lives that were behind that as well. And there is just so much pressure in those schools to perform. Um, and it's kind of, it's, 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 it's too much in a way, and these guys put so much pressure on themselves, that when something happens whereby they can't perform, or that they failed in some small way, it's often just too much for them to take, and I've seen those guys break down and really come apart. Um, it's incredible watching guys like that, even guys who I had in my own year in school, who just really crashed and burned in a, in a really hard way. So that was something that I'd observed, and I, and I understood, and I, and I knew it. And it was an important element that we really wanted to bring to the film. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. How was Jack discovered? Um, so yes, how did you come to the project? What was that process? And um, we did a big troll of, of we did a huge sort of casting troll, and we looked at most of the schools that were relevant, and we looked at you know groups of kids who were acting, and also just sports clubs and things. And um, uh, out of that process, Jack uh, emerged as somebody that I knew was, I mean, I, was, I sort of knew very quickly that I was going to cast him, although we did go through a long process. Um, I didn't want him to feel too uh, cocky about it. Um, but, uh, so we put him through it. Um, but uh, Jack has acted, he had acted before he acted, he had a, a smaller part in the film that shot just before we did it. Um, but I don't know, sometimes actors just, some actors really do have something, and it is, it's the old cliche of some quality, but there really is that thing that you see, and as a director you get better at recognising it. Sometimes it doesn't come over in full flower in an audition, but you can kind of see something. And I, I felt that Jack really, and also Jack, I think really understood the boy who we were thinking about when we were thinking about this film. And so much so that, one, and this is something I always do as well, when we cast Jack, we, we shifted the film a little bit to 
to suit him. So rather than trying to squeeze an actor into a pre-existing role, it's kind of more interesting to try to bring the actor and the role together a little bit. But he's very good. <laughs> We have time for one more. We've got another one in the house. Yes, thank you. Uh, there's a song in the credits called Bitches Love My Planking. Yes. Can you explain that? <laughs> Great. Uh, the song at the end. Is it sorry? Bitches Love My Planking. Your Planking. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Can you talk about that song? It's a very interesting, interesting observation. <laughs> well, well made. Um, you know, when you're, putting, when you're doing a low budget film, you get incidental music, you get it from anywhere, right? And a friend of mine who's a very fine singer, her boy is 17 and is very postmodern in his, in his general demeanor. And that's his band, all their songs are quite thoughtful, but they all have these outrageous names. But I, so I didn't make up the name, but I did use the music, so I had to put it in the credits. <laughs> Amazing. That seems like an awesome place to end this Q&A. Um, so thank you all for speaking. Thing, which is that um, we were asked by people to would we be on Twitter so that if people wanted to ask us any more questions they they could uh, follow us and ask us on Twitter. So um, I'm Lenny Abrahamson, all one word, just at Lenny Abrahamson and Jack. Abrahamson, Jack Rayner. So at uh, Jack Rayner, so you can ask any further questions if you think of them. Fantastic.